be. If you'd like to turn there, Acts chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 34, starting a new series today called The Happy Heart, and uh, it's going to carry us through November and leading up to Thanksgiving, and it is going to be a blessing. I know it's already been a blessing to me as I've begun to study, and it is going to be something that I believe if you come to and you listen and you apply to your life, if you apply the Word of God to your life, you will end up at the end of November with a happier heart than when you started. That is the goal, and the goal obviously is to honor Christ through the preaching of his word. And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 34. If you found your place there, would you give me a good hearty amen? Amen. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer... A slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out and saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of of her that very moment. Verse 19, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. Verse 22, the crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open up your word, to learn from it. We ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts through it that we would be changed by him, and Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in all these things. Lord, we love you, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us, we thank you for being able to wake up and breathe another breath. Now, most of all, we thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. I pray if there's anybody here that truly does not know you as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Someone once said, there is in every soul an insatiable hunger to be happy. We see that in our world. We see a desire to be happy, to be fulfilled, to live a life that is filled with happiness. But how does one find happiness? Well, the world says that one finds happiness through money, through vacations, through travel, possibly through food or through sex through having perfect health or a perfect body. Maybe it's found, they say, in self-expression. And the list goes on and on. But as it normally is in God's world, things are upside down when it comes to happiness. It's not the normal way that we would think we should find happiness according to God. And so I want to go over the next couple of weeks and talk about the four principles of a happy heart. If you want to be happy in life, truly happy, there are four basic principles that I believe can be found in the Word of God that will actually give you that happiness. Today we're talking about the first principle, principle number one, the happy heart praises God. The happy heart praises God. God. That is the first principle that we're going to be talking about all today. And next week, I invite you to come back. I encourage you to come back as we look at the next principle. But today, we're focusing on this first principle, the happy heart praises God. And under that, we're going to look at four specific ways that you and I 
can actually do that? How do we actually praise God? What should we praise him for? Well, number one, the happy heart praises God as sovereign. We praise God as sovereign. And if you need a little definition of sovereign, we talk about it a lot at this church. The sovereignty of God or to be sovereign means that he is in complete control. It's that simple. God is sovereign. God is in complete control. Would you say complete control with me? Complete control. And you think about this passage and you think about Paul and Silas in these circumstances. Are you with me this morning? Say amen. Now, sometimes we read the word of God and we hear the word of God and it just kind of washes over us and we're like, yeah, I've heard that story before. And we forget that these are real people in real circumstances and they had real things, horrible things happened to them. Listen to what happens to them. First of all, in verse 22, it says, a crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them. And then they proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. The first part is humiliation. Their, their robes are torn off of them. And then they're beaten with rods. It says they were struck with many blows. So their robes are torn off. They're beginning to be beaten. And then it says they're thrown into the inner part of a prison. And this prison is not the prison like a prison here in America. Now, I've never been to prison. I never want to go. Amen? But our prisons are like palaces compared to what prisons were in that day. This was a dank, dark, nasty-smelling cave, basically. And they threw them into the innermost part of the prison, which would have been the most secure part of the prison. So they're stripped of their robes. They're beaten. They're in tons of pain. They're dragged to prison. They're thrown in the innermost cell. And then they take their feet and they lock them in stocks. But it's not just normal locking someone's feet in stocks, as much as, much as that can be normal, right? Right? They take their feet, and likely they would have spread their feet apart as far as they could to induce cramping. And so they're in this horrid prison. Their feet are in stock. They're in pain from being beat. They're in pain from having their feet placed in stocks. And likely they're laying on their beaten backs on the cold, hard ground, which is filled with feces and urine. Fun times, right? And yet, we see in verse 25, it says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and what? Singing hymns of praise to God. They're in, you've never been in a situation like this, amen? They're in much worse of a situation than I've ever been, and yet they're praising God in song. What an amazing thing. How in the world do these men praise God in the midst of having their robes beaten, or their robes torn off, their bodies beaten, they're thrown into prison, they're in the middle of this dark, dungy, smelly prison in stocks. How in the world do these men praise God in the midst of these horrendous circumstances? Well, first and foremost, they understood that praising God does not depend on on circumstances. Listen, praising God does not depend on circumstances. Amen? Amen? Praising God depends, listen to me, on God. Period. Now, if you listen to other preachers, maybe you turn on the TV, you like a person that smiles a lot and has a good southern accent. If you listen to him, he'll tell you, praising God comes when he gives you what you want. When you have the health that you've spoken out loud and claimed when you said I will have that car I will have this house when I will have that job God's gonna bless you amen maybe not in the way that you think he should bless you and yet we are commanded and called to praise God no matter what Isaiah 46 verse 9 through 11 speaks of our God that we should praise and it speaks of his sovereignty it says this it's very small it says remember the former things of old this is God speaking through the prophet. He says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Whenever you hear God say this in the scriptures, he's basically just saying, just remember who you are. He's not even necessarily remember who I am. He's saying, remember you, who you are and compared to me. I am God. I am sovereign. I am in control of all things. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things not yet done. Saying... My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east and a man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will 
do it. You see, that is God in full control of all things. Now, it's important to remember that God is sovereign. It is important to remind ourselves every single day and literally get up and say, God is in control. God is in control. You see, A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, that is a complete contrast in terms of what the world tells you, what you think about yourself is important, right? Because we have all this craziness going on in our society, right? You turn on the news and you're like, man, people are thinking they're a man and they think they're a woman. They're a woman, they think they're a man. You're like, what? Why does this happen? It's because the most important thing about you is how you think about God. And what's happening in that instance is they're not having a right understanding of God. Therefore, they don't have a right understanding of themselves, What comes into your minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He continues, listen, a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology but to practical Christian living as well. What is he saying? He's saying it's not just important that you know about God and you understand God for who he truly is in your mind. He says it affects the way you live. He says it is to worship what the foundation is to the temple. Where it is inadequate or out of plumb, The whole structure must sooner or later collapse. You who are builders, you know, if you don't lay a proper foundation, if the foundation is off, those parts of the building are going to be off. Possibly the whole building, the whole structure will be off. This is, he's comparing this to how we think about God. If we don't get God right, everything's going to be off in our life. He continues, he says, I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble thoughts about God. Let me just say that as I would understand it. Your theology, theology is a study of God, right? Theos is God, ology is study. The study. Your study of God, your theology, determines your thoughts, which determines your actions. Right? The way that you think determines what you do. That's why your mom, when you were little, said, why'd you do that? Why did you do that? And you said, well, because I thought... You had a process, you had a thought, right? This will lead to this. You didn't think it would do that, and you thought wrong, and so you got your mom smacking you a bit, right? You see, our actions are determined determined by our thoughts, and this is no more true than how we think about God. What we believe about God will will determine how we live, and if we believe God is always in control, it will enable us to praise him in any circumstance. This is exactly what we see with Paul and Silas. They knew God, and so their circumstances were subjected to what they knew about God. And so their actions did not go off what they were going through. They went off who God was. And it's how Paul could later say in, the Flip, in Philippians to the Philippian believers, listen, the Philippian believers were poor. They were persecuted. They were going through rough times. And Paul says to them what? He says in verse number 4 of chapter 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord. What's the next word? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, and again I'm going to tell you, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will tell you, rejoice. Paul says from personal experience, I can have joy, I can have happiness in any circumstances because it's in the Lord, it's not in my circumstance. You see, when we praise God for his complete control over all things, including any situation we are currently in, it enables us to be happy in all circumstances. God is in control. Amen? Now, my sister just sold her house in Florida. She sent me a picture of a check that she got. She, she only said that. She only did this because it took a long time. It was a process. It was in and out. Is it going to happen? Isn't that going to happen? What's going to happen here? Finally, they got the check, all right? And I texted her like a good pastor would. I said, Vegas, baby. Let's go, right? Yikes. You see, the irony of it is, is that even in Vegas, God is in control. The roll of the dice, the Bible says, is from the Lord. There's no mistakes, there's no accidents. The little thing to the biggest thing is all under God's control. We must constantly remind ourselves in the thick of it, when life is hard, that God is in control. It's how we stay calm in a frantic situation. Charles Spurgeon says, nothing can happen but what God ordains, and therefore, why should we fear? 
You see, in this moment in time, especially maybe a year ago, this is when the church should shine the brightest. A global pandemic, right? The church should have the least fear. I'm not saying we aren't wise, we don't do things to protect ourselves, but we should not be exhibiting fear because, listen, why? Our God is in control, amen? And we know the sovereignty of God. I've stood at this pulpit and preached it probably over 50 times about the sovereignty of God. He's in control. And we know it and we know it and we know it. But then we get in a pinch and we automatically forget it. Right? Tomorrow something could happen and you'll forget this sermon. you forget that God is still in control. If I were ever going to get a tattoo, you know what I would get? Braves, 2021. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I would get on my, under, under my eyelids, God is in control, right? Just so I could see it all the time. Obviously, I would not do that. That's ridiculous and silly. But man, we need to be reminded that our God is truly in control. Now, a very familiar verse, one that you probably have memorized, Romans 8, 28, reminds us that not only is he in control, but he's in control, listen, for our good, for your good. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God is, is doing things in order that it might benefit you for good. Amen? If you're an unbeliever, God is drawing you. He's trying to get you to come to him so that it will be for good. But otherwise, everything is for bad. <laughs> Romans 8, 28, and we know, we know, amen, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. How many of you know that verse? We've heard it at least once or twice. Maybe you memorized it. But you see, everything hinges on how one, one word in that verse is interpreted. What is that word? It's good. That one word, everything hinges on that one word, good. What does good actually mean? Does it mean wealth? God works everything for your wealth, for your health, for your prosperity, for your to get a good job, for your marriage to work, for you to find a spouse? Or does it mean that God's definition of good might be different from ours? Does it mean God's good is completely different from ours as we think carnally about it? You see, God's definition of good is the greatest good, and it is completely different from the average person's definition of good. So which that brings us to our second happy heart point, which is the happy heart praises God in sanctification. Now, don't tune me out here, okay? This is extremely, extremely important, and I know you've heard it from me before. What is sanctification? If you need a simple definition for sanctification, it's, it's simply being made holy or being more, made more like Christ every single day. Sanctification is the process by which God conforms and molds us more and more into the image of his son. That, listen, that is God's greatest goal for your life. That is God's, listen, plan for your life. I know one person that is constantly struggling with the plan of God, what they should do. I'm not talking about anybody in this church. But they're struggling and they're, they're just trying to figure out, what does God want me to do? Here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to be made more like Christ. He wants you to develop your heart and your life into Christ's likeness. He wants you to be holy. And if you will pursue that, he will show you all the other things. He will show you what job to take. He will show you what road to take. He will show you what person to marry. If, listen, if you will pursue what he says is ultimate good, which is holiness. Being more like Christ. We're not talking about perfection for perfection's sake. We're talking about being made into the image of Jesus so that Jesus can have glory in your life. Romans 8.29. We just read Romans 8.28. We all know that one, right? But do you know 8.29? Look at 8.29. For those whom he foreknew. He's talking about believers who he knew before time. It says he also predestined. That is, he destined them for what? If you're a Christian, this is hugely important. God has destined you for what? To be conformed to the image of his son. So listen, a smart person, an average person, a dumb person can figure out if God has made me, if God has saved me, if this is his purpose to be conformed into the image of his son, if I'm not being conformed into the image of his son, what does that say about your salvation? 
This is a real biblical self-evidencing check. Am I a Christian? You've asked that, I've asked that. We've had doubts. You know, one of the greatest ways to figure it out is to say, not go back and say, did I say that prayer? Did I really do that? I remember that date. That's when it was. No, it's to say, am I now presently and am I continuing in Christ-likeness? Not perfection. Am I pursuing godliness? Am I pursuing holiness in my life? Am I trying to be like Jesus in every single way? That's what we call sanctification. Salvation always produces sanctification. True, genuine, saving faith produces true, genuine, changing faith. God's not going to save you and leave you like that. He promised it. He said it. He's going to do it. If God's going to do something, is he going to get it done? So if you're not changing, if you're not more like Christ than you were a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whoa, wake up. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says, Husbands, this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian believers, Husbands, love your wives. How are you supposed to love your wife, husbands? Well, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 26, though, is where I want to focus. He says that he might sanctify her. Who's her? He's talking about the church. He says God sanctifies the church. How does he sanctify the church? Through the word of God and the spirit of God. We just talked about what it means to sanctify, to make holy. Who is the church? It's not this building, right? Who, who is the church? You are the church. If you're a believer, you are the church. And so God says in this verse, he says, listen, I'm going to cleanse the church. He continues, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So what is he saying? He's saying God is going to wash the church clean with his word and make her like his son. He is going to Give her holiness through sanctification. You see, Christ shed his blood for your salvation as much as he did for your sanctification. We think, okay, God died for me. God, God, God sent Jesus. He bled on the cross. He did all those things for me so that I could have a home in heaven, so that I can be saved. But it doesn't stop there. It's so that you can be changed here and now. It's for your sanctification here and now. Amen? Amen? And the mission, listen to me, the mission of every true church is to be the sanctification of Christ's body. My mission as a pastor, yes, I want to see the lost saved. I want to see people come into this church and become believers and grow in discipleship. But my number one priority, other than the glory of God, is to see you who are already here become more like Christ. The goal of the pastor, the goal of the leadership of a church is to attempt to lead every single person in that church to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. They do this through the preaching and teaching of the word, through loving one another, through fellowship, through communion, through discipleship, and this ultimately brings glory to Christ. There are too many churches that are about how many people they can get in rather than how many people they can make like Christ. And if the church will focus on sanctification, if the church will focus on sanctifying its members, I don't do it as a pastor, the Spirit of God does it as I preach the Word of God, but if the church will focus on that, guess what will happen? Salvations will happen. Because when you look in the New Testament, you don't see these New Testament churches and these New Testament pastors doing all this hoopla to try to get people into their building. No, what do you read? You read that people come in because they found out how well this person loved. They found out that this person was different. They found out that this person served a God that was different from any other God. That this person, listen, people came to church in the New Testament times in the apostolic period. You know why they came to church? Because they saw Christ in people. What is that? That's sanctification. The church has lost its power because it's lost its sanctity. Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 
And then he goes on to say it's, it's, it's that you would abstain from sexual immorality. That's just one little part of sanctification. This is one little area. Your sexual desires, your sexual personhood, who you are sexually. That needs to be given over and, and laid at the feet of Christ and say, you make me who you want me to be in that area. You do with me as you will. I'm going to obey your word. That's sanctification in one instance, in one example, sexuality. But we know that we need to be sanctified in all areas. See, the result of our sanctification here is not only Christ's likeness here, but eternal rewards hereafter. You say, why should I be sanctified? Well, number one, it will make you happy. See, God doesn't want you to be happy first. He wants you to be holy first. And if you're holy first, then you'll be happy second. God wants you to be holy because he knows in being holy, being more like Christ, you will find happiness but it's not just about here and now. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17. Are you listening to say amen? amen? Paul, again, he says to the Corinthians, so we do not lose heart. How many of you need to hear that this morning? Don't lose heart. Don't give up, all right? He says, though our outer self is wasting away, that is, how many of you can testify this body is not once what it once was, amen? amen? He says our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's sanctification. Who you are is not the outward person, it's the inward person. And Paul says, God is renewing your inward person daily, day by day, moment by moment. He's trying to sanctify you. Verse 17, he says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You have rewards in heaven. It's not just heaven as your reward. It's not just being with Christ. That is the greatest thing. That is the only thing that we need. Amen? Amen. But as we allow God to sanctify us here and now, as we allow God to change us here and now, that begins to store up rewards in the, etern in, in the eternal heaven. You see, understand God is doing a work in you. Understand that everything that happens to you happens, what do we say? Everything that happens to you happens for a what? Reason. You see, the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the believer knows what the reason is. The believer knows that the reason is to be more like Christ and therefore you will glorify God more and in turn God will increase your happiness. Understand God is doing a work in you. Understand that everything that happens to you happens in order to make you more like Jesus. And this enables you to praise him in the sanctification process. Now listen to me. Are you listening to say amen? The sanctification process is normally very painful. <laughs> Amen? Because God will use anything and everything to get you to wake up and say, yes, instead of all these other things I've been chasing, I want to be more like Christ. And even when you submit to that, God will use anything and everything to begin to purify your life, to begin to mold you into the image of Christ. And it's in those times that we must first say, God is in control. Praise God. He's sovereign. He is in complete control. And then we also praise him, Lord, I know this is a rough time. I know I didn't, I didn't expect for my car to break down. I didn't expect for that relationship to blow up like that. I didn't expect for this to happen. But God, I'm going to allow you to use that awful, horrible thing to make me more like Jesus Christ. Happiness is found in those things. Thirdly, the happy heart praises God. This is very important from the Spirit we praise God, we worship God in spirit and in truth. And the spirit is a person. There's a silly little thing going around. I'm not on TikTok, but I'm on Instagram and, and Facebook. And holy spirit, activate. Y'all hear that stupid, stupid, stupid thing. It's, it's, it's this little chant. I think it came from Family Feud. This woman is on Family Feud, a game show. And she's about to answer all these questions. And she starts going, holy spirit, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. It's kind of blasphemous. Acting like the Holy Spirit is your little servant boy who comes and does things for you when you want him to. No, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is God. And the, the way that we become happy and the way that we praise God from the Spirit is recognizing that the Holy Spirit is the person that does the work and the will of God in and through us through the Word of God. Now, at the beginning of Acts, in your Bible, you might have a title. You don't have to go there, but if you want, you can just look at the beginning. Maybe go back later today and look and see what it says. Normally, it says the Acts of the Apostles, right? But the book of Acts, I don't think it should be called the Acts of the Apostles. 
I think it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Silas, listen to me, Paul and Silas don't do any of this unless they are filled with the spirit of the living God. They don't praise God in the middle of jail cell with their feet in stocks, beaten, robes stripped off them. They don't praise God unless it's from the Holy Spirit. You will never praise God in the true and pure way that God wants you to praise him unless it's from the Holy Spirit. See, the only way this supernatural response happens is through God, the Spirit, continually pouring out of these men. That's what we see in the book of Acts. We see the Spirit of God moving through people. Galatians 5.22 tells us that happiness is actually a fruit of the Spirit. So if you're not happy in the Lord, you can tell that you're not walking in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second one? Joy. Joy and happiness are the same thing. I've heard some preachers say, oh, the difference between joy and happiness is this and that. It's the same thing. If you're happy, you're happy. Sometimes you're happy and you're screaming out loud and you're cheering, right? Sometimes you're happy just in your heart of hearts. You're content and you're quiet and you're peaceful, but you're happy. It's the same thing. And the fruit of the Spirit in your life is joy. So one of the easiest checkpoints to tell if you are in the Spirit is to ask yourself, do I have joy? One of the easiest checkpoints to tell if you are walking in the Spirit is to ask yourself, is there a song of praise in my heart? You know, my dad used to whistle all the time. Man, it'd get on my nerves. <laughs> just whistling, whistling, he'd be in the car whistling, everything, just whistling, whistling. And it was a, a happy tune, right? Do you find a happy tune in your heart? Or is it a spirit of curmudgeonism? <laughs> is it a spirit of negativity? You see, the believer who's walking in the Spirit will have a song of praise in their heart. When was the last time you sang praises, listen, for, from, from a heart of real joy? That you weren't coerced by Linda up here, right? She doesn't do that. I know she don't do it. She just comes up here and she just wants to sing. She wants to, I tell the worship team, listen, you worship God first. You don't worry about the audience. You don't worry about those people out there. You just bring the glory and honor to God. And as they see you worshiping, they will worship in turn. When was the last time I sang praises from real joy? Ephesians 5, 18 through 19 tells us that if you're in the spirit, songs are going to come out. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. He's contrasting. He says, but be filled with the spirit. In verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. See, in the early church, they would greet one another with songs and, and hymns and spiritual songs, and they would sing praises to God for one another. What would it be like if we sang a song of blessing to someone as we saw them? Please don't do that to me. I'll punch you in your face. <laughs> that is, like, don't do that, all right? I won't really punch you in your face, but I don't like that, all right? But you can say scripture, right? If you can sing, sing. You don't want to hear me sing to you, Okay? But you know where this happens? I'm not talking about going up to somebody and, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord and you just start bursting out in song? No, don't. No, we're talking about here and worship. You see, when you sing worship to God in the service, when you lift your voice and praise him, guess what it does? It blesses God, number one. But what else does it do? It blesses Gunner. It blesses Nikki. It blesses Stacy. It blesses, it blesses other people beside you. You know when you come in sometimes and you sing and you're like, man, it's really bumping today. It's really good. Man, people are singing. This is awesome. Isn't that a good feeling? Amen? It's encouraging. And then other times you come in and we're like, oh, I don't really like this song, so I'm just going to kind of mouth it, but I'm not going to say anything. Watermelon, watermelon. You never heard that? They teach you that in school. They taught me, if you don't know the words, just say watermelon. It'll look like you're singing. That's what they said. I think it works. You see, we encourage one another. We lift one another up. We have happy hearts when we praise the Lord in the spirit. So how do we live in the spirit so that we will have a happy heart and praise him in the midst of every circumstance? Well, walking in the spirit is having Christ foremost in all of our affections. Now, this is not very practical. Are you listening to say amen? You see, there's a lot of preachers out there preaching practicality. This is how 10 steps to a better marriage, 10 steps to a, a better financial uh, portfolio, 10 steps. No, 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 no. Listen, the church is about Christ. And Christ changes us from the inside out. When you do those other things, guess what you're doing? You're doing the law. You're doing works. You're legalistic. 
Christ wants to change us from the inside out, and he does so when we set our affections on him above everything else. It's a daily submission of our wills to Christ. Walking in the Spirit is enabled when we, because of God's grace, we discipline ourselves to submit ourselves to his will. So we're driving in the car, we're getting angry, the person has cut us off again, and I'm about to lose my mind, amen? And I say, no, I'm going to submit my will, my actions, my emotions, my thoughts to the will of God, to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God comes in to a willing heart and takes over. and says, you don't have to do that. You've been bought, you've been redeemed. You're a child of God. You don't need to act that way anymore. Plus, you have a Christian bumper sticker on your back of your car, right? You see, when we walk in the Spirit, what we're really doing is we're living every moment as if we're in the presence of God. Listen, because you are. We're recognizing that God is here in us, with us, living through us. And the things that help support this, you're like, I can never do that. I know you're supposed to do that. I know you're supposed to give the steering wheel to God and say, okay, you control. In this moment, you do it. I can't do it. You know why you can't do it? Because you don't have the disciplines of grace. You're not in the word. You're not in prayer. You're not at church. You are right now. God bless you. But, but we look at those things and we think, that's legalistic. Don't tell me to go study the Bible for 15, 20 minutes a day. Don't tell me to pray. That's, Dave, that's legalistic. We don't live that way anymore. Listen. That, those are disciplines of grace which enable you when the moment happens in the middle of day to live by the Spirit and not according to the flesh. If you're having a difficult time praising God, ask yourself, am I walking in the Spirit? Am I living moment by moment as if Christ is here and I am submitted to Him? The key to having joy in every circumstance of life is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is spoken by John MacArthur. <clears throat> What a great quote. The key to having joy in every circumstance of life is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lastly, number four, the happy heart praises God for salvation. Salvation. See, Paul and Silas, these men were set free before they were ever set free from prison. They were set free because they trusted in Christ. They had been set free from sin through Christ. And Paul knew, listen to me, Paul knew that in that dark, dungy, smelly cell with his feet chained to stocks, having been beaten, he knew that if he died there, that he had a home in heaven. And listen, and he had Christ. Christ is the ultimate prize of the believer. Christ is the ultimate, word, the ultimate reward of the believer. Paul knew that if he died in that prison, their home was in heaven and the reward was Christ forever. See, a true believer knows this and it causes her to literally praise God. Isaiah 61.10. The prophet says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God for he has clothed me, listen to this, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. See, God has dressed us in salvation in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so there may be a thousand terrible things that happen to you in your life. You hear about these stories of these young women, these young girls who are, who are kidnapped and taken somewhere else and they're sold into sexual slavery. And then you hear the redeeming story of these girls who are taken out of that, they're rescued and they come to know Christ. See, how can somebody like that ever be happy again? They can be happy in Christ because Christ has dressed those girls in garments of salvation, in clothes of righteousness, never to be stained again, completely whole, completely made new in Christ, a new creation in Christ. And so they praise God and they give glory to God in Jesus Christ because of what he has done for them. Listen to me. Salvation is not something we should take for granted. Amen? We are in the month of thanksgiving. 
We should be thanking God every day for our salvation, but especially in this month, especially as we near the day of thanks, we should give God the glory and praise for saving our souls. If there's been a thousand terrible things that have happened to you, but you have trusted and treasured Christ, listen to me, not just trusted, not just said a prayer, do you treasure Christ? See, that's how you know if you're a believer. It's not just, I know some facts. No, it's, I know the Savior and I love him. I love him. I love him more than anything in this world. I love him more than my parents. I love him more than my, my wife. I, know, I love him more than my kids. I love him more than things. I love Jesus Christ. If you don't treasure Christ like that, please check yourself. Check your heart. Because the believer understands what Christ has done for him. So there may be a hundred things hundred bad, terrible things that have happened to you, but if you trusted in Christ, you can say what Joseph said when his brothers came back to him. You remember what he said? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Basically, he's saying the New Testament equivalent of everything works out, everything works to the good of those who love him. It's the Romans 8.28 principle. We can have a happy heart. We can be destitute. We can be homeless on the street. I don't think God will ever do that to a believer who's in his will. But we can be in the worst possible situation we could ever think ourselves in. And yet if we have Christ, if we have salvation, we have everything. Not only did Paul and Silas praise God because he had given them salvation. Listen to me. Their praise of God led to salvation. You look at the rest of the verses, verse 25. If you're with me this morning, you're still tracking, say amen. Verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there came a great earthquake. But before the earthquake, did you notice the line? Did you notice the, the sentence? The prisoners were listening to them. Listen, church. Listen, Christian. People are listening to you. They're watching you. They're, they're seeing everything that you do as a believer. And it's either going to push them away from God or it's going to draw them near to God. As you praise God, it will lead others to praise God as well. Verse 26, suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he threw down his sword, or threw a, drew his sword, excuse me, and was about to kill himself supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself or we all are all here. Verse 29, and he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, listen to it. Listen to it, church. What must I do to be saved? The unbelieving world is not going to come to faith by your preaching politics. Amen? The unbelieving world comes to faith in Christ when you praise Christ. Verse 31, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. So it wasn't just one person that got saved from the praise of Paul and Silas. It was a whole family. And who knows how many more people were saved because of praise, because of a happy heart in the midst of dire circumstances, praising God, these people came to salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, here's one more thing before we close. If you could care less about other people's salvation, you yourself are not saved. That's just, that's just biblical. If God has not put in your heart, now, it might have faded a little bit because you, you lived life and you gotten into sin and you're away from God. But if there's never been a heart for to see people saved, to see people come to Christ so that they can praise you like you praise him, you're not saved. It's as simple as that. When we keep a heart of praise, remembering that Christ has saved us eternally, it will inevitably influence those around us who see and hear our praise and will ask in response, what must I do to be saved? Now in conclusion, you see, praising God for the first point. Remember the first point? God is what? Sovereign or in control, right? We praise God for being in complete control. And that reminds us, it reminds me that God is, just like he said, in control. Amen? 
So whatever's going on in your life, you can come to church, you can praise God, you can lift up holy hands, and you can sing to him because he's in control no matter what. And because God is sovereign, I can do that. I can praise God. But listen, because God loves me and saved me, I can praise him in complete trust. You see, it's one thing to say, God, you're in control. I know you're God. You're God Almighty. You're the king of the universe. You can do anything you want. You can move mountains. You can do whatever. But when you couple that with, God, you also laid down your life for me. You sent your one and only son to die for me. His control is not erratic. His control is not devious. His control is not something that you should fear. His control, if you trust him in Christ and understand that he died for you on the cross, his control tells you that he loves you and you can praise him in both aspects, even in the midst of the storm. Because God is sovereign, I can trust him. And because he is savior, I can praise him. See, I've never had a hard time believing that God is in control. Never had a hard time believing God is in control, but I've had a hard time believing God loves me. Can you relate? I've done it again. But the cross tells me otherwise. The cross proves otherwise. In Acts chapter 4, we're not going to go there for time, but I encourage you to go and read it today. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 30, the people literally say, these are people that are following Christ, they literally say, that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and all these people are doing the will of God. And as Christ was crucified, that was God's plan. That's what they say. That the cross was God's plan. And it is God's plan, amen? And he's in complete control, even to the point of the cross, which shows you his love for you so that you can praise him and not just say, God, you're in control, so I don't know, I'm a little scared. You can say, God, you're in control, and I know you love me, so I don't have anything to fear. The cross was God's foreordained plan to express his otherwise unfathomable love. So what does God want us to do? What does God want you to do? Well, God wants you to what? I tricked you. Yeah. He wants you to praise him, but he wants you to enjoy him. God wants you to enjoy him because when you enjoy God, you praise God. Amen? That's where praise of anything comes from. We got a Braves fan here. We got a Braves fan here. You know why they pray, pray, praise the Braves? Because they enjoy him. They enjoy him. You know why you praise your spouse? Because you enjoy that person. The reason we praise Christ is because we enjoy Christ. The reason we praise God is because we enjoy God. You see, God wants you to enjoy him. You say, what does it mean to enjoy God? What does it mean to enjoy God? I'm asking. What does it mean to enjoy God? That's a really spiritual saying, Pastor Day. What the heck does it mean? I'm still figuring it out. I'm still figuring it out. God wants you to enjoy him. And one of the, the best ways I can kind of relate to this is say, I enjoy my wife. Now, she's not perfect. Everybody say amen. <laughs> she's a sinner just like you and me. But I enjoy spending time with my wife. She's gone a couple days. I missed her. I enjoyed being back with her last night. And I enjoyed spending time with her again and talking to her and seeing her face to face and giving her a hug. And you see, we enjoy people, but there's a limit there. There's a limit in this relationship because I'm a sinner and she's a sinner. And sometimes we don't enjoy each other because we're sinners, right? But God is not a sinner. And so you can have enjoyment with God if you'll get to know him through the reading of the word, through prayer, through coming to church and worshiping him, through getting to know God. See, that's how you praise something. The more you know about something, the more you praise it. Oh, this car has a, has a I was going to say an engine and I have no idea what I'm talking about. Right? We praise things that we know more about, that we love. Man, do you see what I did here? Do you see what I built? God wants you to enjoy him. I want to finish with a quote from C.S. Lewis. Early in his Christian life, C.S. Lewis struggled with the idea that God demands our praise and commands us to give him glory. However, he soon realized that this stumbling block was due to his misconception of God and his misunderstanding of what praise really is. He writes in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, he says, the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. He said, I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of thanks. And that's how we think about God, don't we? About praise towards God. Oh, I'm going to give him a compliment. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to say, God, you bless me so much. You're such a good God. Listen to what he says, though. He said, I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. 
The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Hikers praising the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, actors, cars, horses, colleges, countries, children, flowers, mountaintops. Rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians and scholars. I had not noticed that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmist in telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. That's how you know these people love God. They praise God. They were just telling about the goodness of God. It wasn't coerced. It wasn't forced. It wasn't because a pastor stood up and said, praise God, people. Praise God. Would you get up and praise God? Would you sing a little bit louder? Would you? You see, that doesn't work. No, it's got to come from the heart because you enjoy God. Scotch Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify and commanding us to glorify him. God is inviting us to enjoy him. Do you enjoy God? Do you enjoy him more than a good steak? Do you, I'm serious. Do you enjoy him more than a movie? More than your, your, your game that's on? Do you enjoy God more than your spouse? This is what Christians are to be, are to do. We're to enjoy God. And, and listen, I'm, I'm going to close with this, all right? I'll be the first to admit I don't always enjoy God. But it's not his fault, right? We know God more. We press into him more. The best spiritual times in your life were when you were close to God, Amen. When you were enjoying him, and that enjoyment led to praise. That brings a happy heart. Let's pray.